All right, week 10, college football is here. It is the college football edition of Bet On It. Welcome in Marco D'Angelo, Kelly Stewart, ready to roll here. And uh, we have got a couple of pretty good primetime games coming up this week. Top 25 versus top 25, and maybe none bigger than Ohio State taking on Penn State, Kelly. And number three versus number four, uh, Penn State at home. Noon kickoff here. I don't know what are what are we doing? How much do you got a lot of faith in your boy Will Howard? What do you think is going to happen here? Listen, I I am a Will Howard fan. He was uh, at Kansas State University and won us some really nice games. Here's the reality, and I I think this is something that everybody needs to look at. Whenever there's cluster injuries for a certain skill position like the offensive line, that's not good, and they might be down to their third string tackle against one of the best defensive lines in the country. And, uh, man, that's probably why the Buckeyes can't run the ball or haven't been able to the last couple of weeks. They couldn't do it against Oregon. They couldn't do it against Nebraska. And that makes them a little one-dimensional, guys. And that concerns me about Will Howard, right? Asking this man to put the entire team on his back is something I've seen him do from time to time, but not every single weekend. Here's a Penn State team. Not getting any love in the market, right? This one opened three and a half, three maybe even at Circa. I didn't catch the early number. Three and a half. Start to see fours on the wager talk odd screen. Look, bottom line, everybody wants to know what happened to the Kansas Jayhawks and why they fell off so quickly after one year. Well, that's because their offensive coordinator went to Penn State. That's why Drew Aller doesn't look like the same quarterback we saw last year and neither does the rest of this offense. I was kind of surprised by the total here. Uh, it's it's tough. It's a really tough matchup. I think it's going to be one of the best games on the weekend. And so I can't pass, right? Because if I pass, you guys are going to come in the comment sections and yell at me. So I'm going to do what I always do, and that is take the underdog and make a case for Drew Aller and, of course, my guy, you know, James Franklin. We've had such a troubled relationship over the years. We get along and then... We don't, but we get along when he covers spreads, and we know that's one thing that he loves to make sure that he's done in his last 10 seasons in Happy Valley. So keep an eye on this Penn State line. It gets much higher, and I'm going to have to get involved with the Nittany Lions. Ooh, Lance towards Penn State here, uh, and uh, have to figure out who the quarterback is going to be. So that uh, keep an eye on that game. It will be certainly a hell of a way to kick off week 10 at the uh, 12 noon kickoff on Saturday. Uh, Marco, interesting game coming up here in the ACC. I, I don't know what the hell to make of Pitt. Uh, everyone seems to hate them. They keep winning games. SMU and a one-point win over Duke is not going to move the needle for anybody, but uh, they are laying, what, seven and a half in this one here, so... What do we do on Saturday night with Pitt and SMU? This is going to be a fun game to watch, Joe. You know, yeah, Pitt's not getting a lot of love. They're undefeated, and yet they're still only ranked 18th in the country, and they play in a Power 5 uh, conference. But let's be honest. Uh, I saw something last week involving these two teams to end up being playing one another next week that I don't think I've ever seen. You had Pitt plus five in turnovers, and you had SMU minus six in turnovers in their two games, and yet both teams found a way to win. Uh, let's talk about the pit win last week. First of all, it was a Thursday night game. We know how tough it is uh, for road teams to go in on those Thursday night games, play those weekday games, you know, the crowds riled up. Uh, plus, it was an emotional night. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald was back in town. Uh, they celebrated him being inducted to the College Hall of Fame. So it was the perfect setting for it. But even with that said, I thought Syracuse was the right side in that ball game. And they probably would have been if their quarterback didn't throw five interceptions, three of them being pick sixes. And what happens? You've got Pitt scores 41 points on just 217 yards of offense. Now, let's look at SMU. Last week, they were playing their third straight road game, and they ended up as an 11-point favorite, uh, beating Duke 28-27, uh, escaping with a one-point win. Part of it, you can say, hey, they were looking ahead to this showdown. 
pretty much felt they would be looking at two, uh, you know, two teams that are unbeat uh, looking at this one. But when I look at this one and I say, the, well, sorry, SMU has one loss, but it was, you know, good looking loss. This is a spot where he had six turnovers and they still found a way to win. You do the math, you were minus three in turnovers and you're going to lose uh, close to 90% of the time. Six turnovers, you're not even supposed to be close in the game, and yet they still found a way to win, and they did it putting up a ton of offense. They had 469 yards of offense, giving away six possessions. I look for Pitt's defense, who has played well in recent weeks, but this is the best offense they have faced all year. If SNU doesn't turn the football over, they are going to run wild over Pitt, and they are a balanced attack. They can run the football. They can throw the football. Pitt hasn't seen an offense anywhere close to this all year. And what my concern is that when Pitt falls behind and has to force the issue in the passing game, it's not been good the last few weeks. They are going to be in big-time trouble, and it's going to be them that are throwing the interception in the possible pick six. I'm laying it with SMU. You know I love my Pittsburgh teams, but I love money more. And my money's on SMU minus the points. I got them 35-23. I know you love your Pitt Panthers there, Marco, but uh, at some point uh, this has got to come home uh, to roost here. Why not this week here against SMU? All right, we got another primetime game here, one in which, I don't know, call me, this is the strangest line of the week here as everyone's new favorite team, uh, Texas A&M, is on the road taking on South Carolina. And this opened up minus four for A&M. We're seeing now the money come rolling in on South Carolina. Two and a halfs and even twos are in the marketplace right now with that low total of 44, which was also bet down here. This is uh, interesting here. Maybe, just maybe, a letdown spot here, the market is thinking, for uh, the Texas A&M Aggies after they, what, 31 points they dropped in the second half against LSU. The problem here is that we've got a, a Mike Elko team that's 1-4 and four against the number versus unranked teams this season. Uh, when you look at South Carolina, well, they've done a pretty good job as an underdog in SEC play here. Four and one against the number in their last five in that role. Uh, This is going to be coming out of a bye now. They have an opportunity to be rested at home, catching points in a primetime game. Boy, oh boy, this, uh, it feels like the market, they just want you to bet uh, bet Texas A&M. I wouldn't at all be shocked if not only does AM lose this game after having to go to a quarterback change last week uh, with uh, Marcel Reed, but it would not shock me if South Carolina does what it's done a number of times over the last couple of seasons, and that is absolutely show up and show out here in front of the home ground at a night game. Don't be shocked if South Carolina pulls off the upset here against Texas A&M Saturday night. Time to talk a little gold here with VR and uh, Yanni. It's kind of crazy, but yet here we are. Week 10 of the college football season. Early week action so far. What have you been seeing in the markets? Well, early on during the week, already a, a losing bet for the betting syndicates. In fact, Texas State got steamed multiple times at minus three. I even gave it out to my subscribers at minus three, I think minus 120. And the sharpest shops closed that Texas State at minus five, but they just didn't get there. So started off the week with a loss. At least that's what uh, most of the wise guys did. Now, heading into the weekend action, some of the primetime games that are most meaningful that everybody's looking at, here's some of the, the, the sharper sides. Talk about the Michigan State and Indiana game. A lot of sharp money on Michigan State. Uh, The reason that line hasn't moved significantly is Indiana love from the betting public. I think most of the betting syndicates expect the regression from Indiana. It's just unsustainable to keep playing like that. So taking the seven and a half in the Indiana side, also in Penn State, Penn State against U.S. against Ohio State. Anytime that line is going to four, somebody's reached out and said, grab the four, grab the four, grab the four on the Penn State side against Ohio State. And the under at 47. Now, talking about Ohio State, 
I personally think they're the best team in the country. I know I got a lot of pushback for that, especially from the Oregon fans. People are going to say, oh, we, they, they, what about that game? What about that game? Here's what we know about that game. It was played in Eugene, Oregon, which is one of the strongest home field advantages, and yet Ohio State closed as a three-and-a-half point favorite there. More importantly, with eight minutes left, uh, Ohio State was a 67% probability of winning the game. With five minutes left, Ohio State, over 60% probability of winning that game. It just didn't happen. They lost by one. Rest assured, on a neutral field, Ohio State still three, three and a half, four points better than that Oregon team. Rest assured. Doesn't mean that's what, if they played each other in the national championship, what the line would come out at, because they're, lot, they're trying to balance risk. And most would tend to go with the public side of Oregon, which would make them probably more of a pick em type of game. And you would see a lot of steam on Ohio State if they end up playing. But again, with the Penn State love, they may not even get to play in those playoffs. They got to get that win on Saturday. Now, also Washington against USC. Seeing Washington at plus three and the over 55 and a half against that USC defense, which just continues to regress since the opening game um, against LSU. Now, a team total that got a hit at 17 and a half and then came back and got a hit at 17. That's Hawaii. Hawaii not expected to score a lot of points. And uh, finally, because they got hit again, San Diego State, Boise under from 58 to 57, 56 and a half. And uh, finally, I think I gave you Iowa, Wisconsin. I gave you that earlier. Uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin plus the four over Iowa. Those are pretty much the, the sharp sides that have been confirmed early in the week and uh, still think there's some value for you, some EB there. A lot of the moves, once they move three points, as I explained the very first week, we kind of want to let them go. We know I tracked it over 300 bet sample size. And if you got the opener when it, on a steam play, you hit over 60% of your bets. If you bet it versus the close after move three points or more, you lost money. In fact, with the big, you came a few games under 500. Add the big, you lost a lot of money. So once that line moves three plus points, you leave it alone. That's why I don't even talk about those. I kind of avoid them or bet on it because the, the value has been extracted. You could see that for yourself. Um, so yeah, you're going to see how over the next couple of weeks, the playoff picture will unfold in college football. And uh I think some of these teams that are being propped up because of their records and easier strength of schedules, the cream's going to rise to the top. And I think those teams will start to regress towards the mean um, because, again, they're just uh, a lot of these top 10 teams just probably don't deserve to be there. Uh, when you look at the sharper uh, power ratings out there, I just don't don't agree with them. I mean, just a per- perfect example, a team like BYU, where they have them, you know, ranked, where's BYU now in the nine? Tom, 10 team, yeah, no chance, no chance. So avoid those 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 rankings unless you're going to take advantage of the misconceptions out there. Are, are you seeing any uh, – how about totals in college football, Yanni? Are you see, you're still seeing late steam coming in, um, yep. which is why it's important to join us, of course, every Saturday for last call uh, with you and Kelly as, uh, as you go over some of those moves. But still with the totals, uh, we're still seeing late week, uh, early Saturday morning moves. Yeah, and that's exactly why I don't want to lead betters astray or to the wrong side this early in the week. Mm-hmm. The limits are very low, especially on totals. I have books that will give me five dimes on Saturday that will give me only a nickel mm-hmm. this early in the week. So a lot of the head fakes are coming out, dummying up sides to come in the other way. That's why, I again, I share a lot of the totals on last call, a lot of the team totals on last call. Because that's when the, the the real action comes in. The early stuff is usually on totals taking advantage of injuries, suspensions, mm. and weather. And unless you get out ahead of the market with those, it's you more times than not too late. So be careful of early total moves. They're fake a lot of times. Not so much in the NFL, but in college football, absolutely. Because you can manipulate the market very easily. Yeah, and we know weather changes, so uh, keep an eye on that for sure. And uh, Yanni, uh, always great to see you here, my man. Week 10 of the college football season. We'll see you again on Saturday for Last Call. And, of course, would highly recommend that you guys visit Yanni over his page at wagertalk.com. All right, coming up, we've got, well, we got a Fade Joe Public. We've got a sandwich game. And, of course, time for a little double-digit dog. Yeah, you guys are going to hate this one. And normally this segment is a dog that I think can win outright. 
But the problem is Texas Tech is really banged up. Uh, last week, Morton got a sh- shoulder injury. And as you guys saw that game against TCU, they were in the three-team money line parlay and had many, many opportunities to win that game. That was not very much fun. They lost 35-34. We did get the outright, or excuse me, we did get the against the spread cash, just not the outright. Then Will Hammond came in. He looked all right. So I, I feel like they're fairly on even playing fields, right? There's not a big drop off from Morton to Hammond, but keep in, keep in mind, little asterisk there, right? Tech averaging a little over 38 points a game, but their defense, as I said last week, is awful. But God, I'd like to think that they can run with Iowa State here. Now Iowa State is off a bye. Sitting at 7-0. Everybody's talking about them winning the Big 12. And they, well, they very well could. I'll say that much. This offense also looks great. But the caveat here is they have one of the best defenses in the league. So keep an eye on it. I, I like whether it's Hammond or Whether it's Morton, I like Texas Tech here. I do think Iowa State's defense is going to be a problem, but this is too many points. This is insane. This one opened, uh, what did I have earlier, like 12. And it just keeps going up. Everybody wants to bet Iowa State. And again, I understand the spot here, but this is a good Texas Tech team that needs a win like I need air to breathe. Last week, hopefully didn't take too much out of them, and they go and put up a big fight this weekend in Ames. Yeah, that's a, that's a big, big number there for an Iowa State offense to cover there against Texas Tech. Got to love a little double-digit dog here in Week 10, and we can only follow that up with something absolutely gross and disgusting in the deli, Marco, because there has to be something ugly in a sandwich here this week. No, Marco, what are we looking at? Oh, I'm going to give you a good sandwich, uh, maybe a little pork cutlet here from uh, Iowa. We're looking at an Iowa team that I just absolutely love the spot that they're in. We're looking at Wisconsin, and they're coming off last Saturday night, uh, TV game, home game. How often do you get Wisconsin with a Saturday night TV game against Penn State? Now, that was a big sandwich spot for Penn State last week because you know who they're playing this week. Uh, could they got caught looking ahead last week uh, against the playing in Wisconsin? No. They showed up and took care of business against Wisconsin. And now you got Wisconsin coming off that physical game. All of the hoopla of having Penn State come to town. And they've got to go out on the road and play Iowa. And what kind of team is Iowa? Well, they're a team that's going to run the football down your throat another physical team, and I just don't see Wisconsin having to play two physical-type games in a row. West Virginia pounded the ball at Wisconsin 35 times for 173 yards last week. Uh, I just don't see it. And let's look at the second half of the sandwich. Now, I will know, so you don't uh, tell me uh, on X or in YouTube, but they don't play them for two weeks. Yeah, I get it. Next game, they got a bye week. Then after that, they play Oregon. You're talking about you played Penn State last week and Oregon on deck, and that'll be the first time playing Oregon in conference play. I just don't see Wisconsin being totally focused for this game, being up for it. And since you've already got three losses, all of those you know big goals are gone. You're just happy to be uh, bowl eligible and find out where you're going you're not going to be playing for the uh, playoff series. You're not going to be one of the 12 teams. I don't see them here. Iowa, different story. They still got a lot of stuff in play, and I like this defense. I think they shut down Wisconsin. I'm laying the points with Iowa. I've got to win in this with 27 to 17. Low scoring, typical Iowa fashion, but I'm going to bank on the Hawkeyes to get the job done. Uh, defensively, you get me enough points to get me the cover over a wore out team, Wisconsin. All right. Well, I will get it done. Uh, Wisconsin, very disappointing uh, fourth quarter in that game uh, last week against uh, Penn State. Would have loved to have seen them uh, get it going here, but 
Uh, and in fact, I think they were our uh, fade Joe Public uh, play last week with Wisconsin getting all those points. Uh, this week, uh, we are going to fade Joe Public from a total perspective here. And we're going to take a look at a game that uh, our good friend Ralph Michaels will speak to as well. And that is Nebraska at home taking on to UCLA. And this number opened up at right around 42 and a half, 43. And uh, boy, it just keeps getting bet down. We're down to about 40 now uh, in uh, at Nebraska in this one. And I'm sorry, this is just far too low a number and I get it you look at Nebraska's offense hasn't exactly uh been lighting anybody up you look at UCLA and you're going can we really trust them and I think the answer is uh yes we absolutely can't this total is such a low number especially for a UCLA team uh with Garbers who just went on the road and absolutely lit up And I mean lit up a pretty decent Rutgers defense for 383 yards in the air and four touchdowns. Uh, Nebraska's secondary has not been great by any stretch of the imagination. And I like what UCLA did. They used to be, or tried to be rather, a a very big rush-heavy offense this year. And then they realized, wow, we suck and we can't rush the ball at all. So what did they do? Well, they've decided to let Ethan Garbers start throwing the ball, and it's actually been working. We've talked about UCLA. I love a team that has gotten progressively better each week. You're starting to see that progress. Uh, And I think for sure they're going to be able to go into Nebraska and take on a team that I think has a good shot at losing that Ohio State game twice. I mean, they they had Ohio State. They had that game won couple of terrible uh, calls one way or the other. Uh, The pace of this game will not be extremely quick, but I don't think it's going to have to be. I think Dylan Raiola has all the talent in the world, the freshman. I can tell you this. He's also played much better like freshmen usually do at home in Lincoln than he has out on the road. And I definitely think Nebraska is going to have an opportunity to put some points on his board. But so are the Bruins. I think this number has gotten to a point now where it is time to fade the public move. Everyone's thinking under with these two teams. I'm thinking over with UCLA Nebraska at 40 coming up this Saturday. All right, there he is, the pen. Ralph Michaels ready again here. Week 10 of the college football season. A little TNA. Ralph, I can't believe we're here at Week 10 already, but uh, I love this game that you have circled for us. Talk to us about Nebraska taking on UCLA here this week. Joe, we may be able to steal your segment, and is Ralph High backing UCLA? (laughs) No, I was not. I was actually pretty sober when I made this decision, but I can understand that question. Listen, uh, me blocking for Joe on the offensive line might be able to get the average team 2.5 yards per carry like UCLA is averaging this season. But what I saw at the win at Rutgers was them opening them up. Ethan Garbers, who has a horrendous start to the season, is now passing the ball better. In fact, he had a 4-9 ratio his previous five starts. The Rutgers game, yes, the Rutgers defense is not Nebraska's defense, but he did have a 4-0 ratio and finally looked like a starting Big Ten quarterback. UCLA has played the tougher schedule. They've played the number 13th toughest schedule year to date. And even in conference play, they've played a much tougher schedule than Nebraska. In fact, 21 spots better. And my rankings... Nebraska's played the number 20th toughest schedule. In the, excuse me, UCLA's played the 20th toughest schedule, and Nebraska's played the 41st. But UCLA is actually better in yards per game diff in conference-only games. The reason they've had such an ugly stretch, they're minus six turnovers in conference play. One thing UCLA does do is play very slow. They're number 132 in plays per game ran. So we're going to have a low-scoring game with two poor offenses and a very running clock in this game. When I look at the situation, that does take me to the UCLA side. When you have conference-away dogs of three or more, 
with a total of 45 and a half or less. So we're excluding being 12 of the season, the rivalry week. Away dogs of three or more with a low total since 2006. Winally playing those teams, you've gone 411 and 285, 59.1%. In the NFL, teams off a bye aren't always a positive situation. But when I went and looked at teams off a bye since 2009, when you are playing a conference foe and you're an away dog with rest, you've covered 55.8%. Over 550 games of sample size. If that same team is later in the year from game number eight or later, that number goes to 59.7%. And finally, conference away dogs of three or more with rest from game eight on and a total under 61, 94 ATS wins, 51 ATS losses, 65%. And lastly, Nebraska against conference foes this year, averaging just over 300 yards per game and only 18 points per game. I'm getting six and a half points in a slow-paced game with a rested team against a foe who played an AP top five team to to the buzzer last week. That is a negative situation as well. UCLA gets it done or the second straight week. I love it. Nebraska, UCLA this week. Little TNA, Ralph. What do you got going over on your page at Wager Talk here for this week 10? You know, college football totals have been doing well. I have yet to have a 5% college football total. I've got two games circled, which are I may pull the trigger on. So look tonight or by Thursday morning at the latest for a 5% college football total, my first of the year what we're talking about ralph all right crush it my man it is time for us to talk some best bets all right no better place to start galley than with uh this is an interesting game coming up uh this weekend for a best bet no doubt uh a dog getting points in this one and uh boy oh boy i uh kind of like this on the money line as well what are you looking at for a best bet this week yeah, this is my favorite dog to win outright. And this line comes out at like six. I'm seeing six and a half. And I'm going, what? I'm on the airplane flying home from Kansas. I'm going, uh, what am I missing here? And uh, start looking at it a little bit more. And apparently I wasn't drunk on the airplane because this was six and a half. Uh, here's the reality. One of these teams is going to lose and be one in five in Big 12 play. Somebody has to obviously lose this game, but that's shocking because Both of these teams had pretty high hopes to start the season. I mean, remember, Arizona was ranked at one point in time. But this is a bet against a Knights defense that has struggled basically all season long, including last week versus BYU, where they were a dog, got bet plus one and a half and steamed all the way to three. And that game was never in even close proximity of UCF winning it. I I understand what Malzahn's trying to do and what he's trying to accomplish. But I don't understand the love here, right? Sure, they have a leading rusher in uh, R.J. Harvey, but Arizona has dropped four straight themselves, right? So if you guys remember, I ended up taking them versus Utah. They got the win for me, and we haven't seen anything for them since. There's an interesting situational play here because the Wildcats have to go all the way to Orlando. The bounce house has some really nice, uh, we'll call it, uh, home field advantage, right? We know that place gets loud. But I, again, don't understand the love for the Golden Knights, who their quarterback is going to be, and I'm just not sure that they can stop one of the best wide receivers in the country, albeit K-State was able to do it. But I do think Arizona catching way too many points here is the play. Yeah, uh, poor old Gus uh, trying to save his own arse there, firing the defensive coordinator this week. Yeah, that's the problem, not not the fact that you can't uh, throw the ball at all with any one of your nine quarterbacks. But go ahead, we'll go with the defensive coordinator here. Marco, uh, interesting uh, ass-whooping last week, which I think everyone saw coming uh, for poor uh, Navy here against Notre Dame, but 
uh, can they bounce back uh, this week and get back in the uh, in the W column? I definitely think so, Joe. And before I go into my best bet for this week, I want to tell everybody we got a really special offer going this week at Wager Talk. You know, a uh, full season, three hundred and sixty-five calendar days, is nineteen ninety-nine. But this week, you can pick up by season, one calendar year, every play, every sport, for just eleven hundred and eighty-eight dollars. That comes out to $99 a week, and we are on a roll. As of taping today, the Bet On It show, we are on a 10 and 2 run since last Friday. And you know those 5% plays? Well, last Saturday we had a 5%. It was on California. They won 44 to 7, an absolute blowout, running our record on those plays to 14 and 3, the last 17. Join me. Uh, we're going to have another 5% this weekend. Get every play. You'll never miss a play from me. That's every sport. And the last four years in the NBA, we're number one at Wager Talk. Uh, hockey, last three plus years, work number one in money one at Wager Talk. Doesn't matter the sport. We've been consistent with them all. Join me for calendar year. You'll be glad you did. Now, for this one, Navy's coming off a absolute beatdown by Notre Dame. And so often, you usually have a couple things into play. Teams that go and play Notre Dame usually have a letdown the next week because, you know, it's a big deal. You go play Notre Dame. You won't have that with Navy because they play Notre Dame every year. One of the only teams in the country that do play Notre Dame every year. The other thing is that when you have a team like Navy, and they suffer their first loss, you would think their season's done for any of their big goals that they had and that they might come up flat after that. Nope, not going to happen because everything is still in play for Navy. They are undefeated in the um, athletic uh, American Athletic Conference, the AAC, and they're on a collision course since they're in that conference, and so is Army, where those two teams are undefeated. They could meet in the conference championship game and then meet again when they play their annual Army-Navy game. And the team that comes out of that might just find themselves one of those magical 12 bids for the playoffs. So everything is still in line for them. Now, let's look at the schematics of this game. I tell you all the time, it is tough to prepare for Navy. Well, it wasn't a problem for Notre Dame because they see it every year. Rice doesn't see Navy every year. Uh, so this is going to be new for them to defend against the option. Granted, I will say Rice did play Army earlier in the year, so they could go back and look at tape. I don't know why they would want to, because Army ran all over them in that game. But here's the other thing. You think things are going to be a little hectic down in Houston this week at Rice University? They fired their coach on Sunday. Try preparing for an option attack that you never see when you're also changing uh, coaches during the week. Total chaos down there. There's no way I see them being able to be mentally prepared, physically prepared, and have the X's and O's prepared to be able to handle this Navy offense. Navy rolls on the ground, and they're even getting yardage through the air this year, throwing some passes. Last week, six turnovers against Notre Dame. Just scratch that because prior to that, you got to go all the way back to the first game of the season to see a single turnover from this team. They had only two turnovers for the year going into that Notre Dame game. They get back on track this week against a Rice team that's in total chaos and has no answer for stopping this run. And, oh, by the way, we're laying a big number, minus 11 and a half. What do I tell you guys about teams that run the football well? I'm not worried about laying points because when you got a big lead in the second half and you're milking clock, what are you doing? You're doing what you do well, and that is run the football. So not only are you shortening the game, killing clock, but protecting the lead, you also have the opportunity to add to the score because you do what you do well. It's not like a passing team all of a sudden trying to run the clock out uh, on the ground. I'm laying it with Navy. I look for this to be a total beatdown 
by the midshipman. I'm calling it Navy. Navy, 41-20 to in a big blowout win. Don't be afraid to lay it, says Marco here. And, well, I've got an interesting one, although I don't know why we keep getting this this year, but here we are with Arkansas as a home dog once again, now getting over a touchdown, and I, for the life of me, don't get it. I especially don't get it with Arkansas taking on Old Miss. Why? Because they're 10 and 1 against the number with four straight covers against this Old Miss team. In fact, the home team has now won five straight in this series. They've also pulled out six outright upsets in this series since 2014. Now, Old Miss, 6 and 2 on the season. That loss to Kentucky and then to LSU was heart wrenching uh, for Old Miss. They had big time aspirations this year, but. The injuries started to pile up on the offensive side of things for them. And look, last week they take on Oklahoma, and they trailed Oklahoma 14-10 to in that game. And we all know Oklahoma offensively is about as challenged as it comes. Now they got to go back on the road to head to hog heaven here where the home crowd is going to be into it. And Pittman, uh, head coach for Arkansas, says that his number one wide receiver, who was a late scratch last week, uh, Jaquindon Jackson will be back for this game. That's great news for Talon Green, who uh, should have no problem finding opportunities here to be able to throw the ball. Listen, getting over a touchdown at home in this spot, you got to love that with Arkansas. They have proven time and time again, especially against better competition here, that they are going to be a tough out. We've seen old Miss in this spot as a road favorite against LSU. What happened? They lost outright. Now they're again a road favorite against Arkansas. I don't know that they'll lose outright, but there is no way that I am not backing Arkansas getting over a touchdown in this game against what should be a pretty fun game to watch, but I do think it's going to come down to a final possession I'll take the eight points. I'll take Arkansas, especially against Old Miss, because it has been that profitable over the years. And there you got it. We got best bets for a week 10 in the books. Don't forget to visit and take advantage of Marco's opportunity. Partner with him for one year across the board on his page over at wagertalk.com. And don't forget to hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button, become part of the Wager Talk TV family because you don't want to miss, oh, I don't know, the NFL edition of Bet On It where we swept the board last week with best bets, and I'm sure we're looking to cash a few more this week. So uh, on behalf of Kelly and Marco, guys, we appreciate it. As always, thank you to Ralph Michaels and to VR. Make plans to come back and join us again for another edition of College Football Bet On It. Until then... Check out the video on your screen right now for more game previews coming up in week 10 of college football.